The McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now, here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Ulrich along with David McIlvaney. Our guest today, Ambrose Evans Pritchard. David, of course, we've had on numerous times from the Telegraph, the London Telegraph. We like his view because we're getting a European or an Englishman's view basically on Europe, on Russia, on the U.S. dollar. You know, it's, it's interesting. Sometimes you have to change your perspective, step away from your own center of influence, and step outside the room and look at what it looks like from the outside. I think there's two perspectives that Ambrose brings in terms of his history of thought, which is experience in the context of the Cold War and experience in the context of the creation of the euro as a project. So watching it sort of from inception forward, these are two things that, that he... I don't, I don't want to say babysat, but as a writer, was certainly cognizant of and was addressing the controversial issues and has been addressing them for the last 30-plus years. Well, and I think it's worth pointing out, he was very vocal against the euro. You know, Britain still is on the British pound, and part of that probably was the influence of some of the press at the time that they were putting this together. So The idea of being a Eurosceptic, it's an interesting thing, because on the one hand, we've, we've balanced out this perspective with having someone on like Frank Biancari with the uh, LEAP 2020 group in Europe. And it's, you know, you have folks that certainly see greater integration possibilities and positive steps being made towards that. The Eurosceptic crowd, Ambrose being, I think, a part of that, would say, listen, you've got a political problem. In spite of having a European monetary union, you don't have fiscal and political union, and to cede sovereignty is something that will not happen as long as you have voter interest in play. If we're talking about a world in which countries are still operating as democracies, then the popular vote is going to dictate that this is a failed project from the get-go. Because at the end of the day, a Swede is a Swede, an Italian is Italian, a Spaniard is a Spaniard, and you put enough pressure on any of these people, and they're willing to take the general categorization of European and substitute the particular categorization of their own home country in its place. So, yeah, yes, Pointing out in our conversation, the recording with Ambrose was done a number of days ago, and these are the issues that we see that are very important. Europe, yes, there is still trouble ahead, and there are major hurdles to get over. Looking at the U.S., looking at our relationship with Russia, there is an issue in play, and the question is how is it going to be resolved diplomatically? Would there ultimately be conflict? We won't know. And even if we accelerate into more of a conflict militarily, we still don't know if that's short-lived, one week, one month, five years. And there is this notion, too, I think we should remember from our own history and our own relationship with England, that size doesn't necessarily matter in the context of warfare. It's how you attack, when you attack, the means by which you attack. And, you know, so I'm one that would say, although Russia is small in comparison to the United States, roughly the size of California, California is the sixth largest economy in the world. So we are still talking about on a relative basis on a global scale a very significant economy perhaps not as grand or powerful as the United States but again what we've found in recent weeks is that mysteriously an Illinois power terminal gets shut down remotely via the internet how does that happen and who did it yeah cyber warfare is one method that Russia has specialized in and this is where we have to remember anything if we remember anything from jiu-jitsu or judo the little guy sometimes has an advantage if he's leveraging your energy and so what do we bring to the table that can be leveraged against us I think these are things that we have to at least keep in mind as we consider Russia. Well, in putting this in perspective, it is good to look at the context of the person we're talking to. That's what we try to do with every guest. And, you know, uh, Ambrose Evans Pritchard can tell us what it felt like to be a European during the Cold War. He really does not want to see that return. It's the same thing with uh, the U.S. dollar. In this interview, I think the most critical insight that he brings is 
chaos in the emerging markets. Mm. And he does tie that to the U.S. dollar. He ties it as a correlation, basically saying cheap borrowed money went out from the United States and into the emerging markets. And what we are on the front edge of is capital controls as we see a meltdown in the emerging market, not only bonds, but equities and a return of some of those dollars back into the U.S. milieu. What do we have there? Uh, well, he thinks a dollar rally, a healthy dollar rally, perhaps a sustained dollar rally. I think it's worth noting that it's not that a dollar necessarily buys you that many more goods and services. We're talking about a dollar rally vis-a-vis a weaker euro and weaker emerging market or developing market currency. Yeah, I think an important analogy it would be guys jumping out of an airplane, you know, parachuting. You might have some falling at a quicker rate than others based on how they're, you know, and that's what happens with currencies, okay? You may have the euro buying less and less and less each year. You may have the dollar buying a little more of less and less, and that's what he's talking about. A dollar rally doesn't necessarily mean the dollar survives its buying power. From beginning to end, this is a great interview. Stick with it. Listen to every detail. Well, there are many issues to remain aware of in Europe, and you know, unemployment rates have been stubbornly high. We still have debt levels, which are also so high. Debt ratios now to GDP are moving higher due to a very slow or more of an economic growth. And you know, the contrast, there is a contrast between a more highly functioning North or Germany and a dysfunctional South. I think that's easy for everyone to see, though Germany has its challenges too. But into this, you bring the issues of energy insecurity in relation to Russia. You first had Crimea, now you have Ukraine. You know, Tomorrow we may see the knock-on effects from a growing conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And this is coming at a time when, frankly, Europe needs a tailwind. It's getting the exact opposite, another headwind to recovery. And we have a series of these headwinds to recovery. So our conversation today with Ambrose Evans Pritchard is, is to sort through a number of these issues and, and pragmatically see what solutions exist. So of particular relevance for me as, as a U.S. investor in a fiat currency system is the weakness of the euro currency and the boost that that gives to the dollar. Not in absolute terms, but again, sort of relatively speaking, the dollar doing better relative to the euro. And I just, I, I wonder what has happened to absolutes. Everything is relative these days. Dollar versus, uh, or vis-a-vis the euro, uh, emerging markets vis-a-vis the developing markets, uh, Germany vis-a-vis the peripheral European countries. What's happened to judging things on their own merits as opposed to sort of these relative measures when everything seems to be sinking, we seem to lose perspective. That's a very sort of deep question. I mean, you're getting into the issues of why we're in this mess in the world. You know, what's been going on for the last 20 years that's caused this uh, essentially low growth trap we're in. And, I, you know, there are all kinds of causes. It's the, the, the distorted effects of globalization. It's this huge sort of Asian savings glut. It's the, the world's savings ratio has been rising every year to a fresh record of 25% of global GDP. That's basically taking money out of the system for demand. It's putting it into capital, which just floats around and just causes bubbles everywhere. These are deep, deep sort of themes in, in what's been happening here. And, you know, the, the Western central banks have been trying to respond to this as with the old tools. They, you know, they see, see a problem, they throw some stimulus at it. It's quite understandable. But the problems are intractable, but they're so deep-rooted. And we're now in a world where, although all this money being, is being created, it's not actually creating inflation. As you can see, we're actually getting nearer and nearer deflation. And they're not getting a lot of traction with these policies as part of the problem. You know, we may be now be in a world where I mean, Larry Summers has been saying this, you know, the U.S. needs interest rates of minus 3% just to be in equilibrium. In academic parlance, it's the, the, the Wixellian natural rate of interest has now fallen below zero. This is very, very extreme circumstances, and we don't quite know how to respond to it. You know, we have, on the other hand, the IMF fearing asset bubbles being promoted by ultra-low rates. And this is the opposite theme. Central banks have been accommodative. They've been stimulating economies via low rates and implicitly taxing savers, using the low rates as a form of financial repression or, or income redirection. So you have, on the one hand, central banks with low rates. They haven't been able to accomplish everything that they've wanted to. We do slip towards negative growth rates in spite of what they're doing. And is it really possible to throw that much more stimulus at it and hope for a different effect? Yeah, this is really the Bank for International Settlements that's been pushing this theme really hard. They've come out with a series of reports, and actually I interviewed the, the, the managing director quite recently, and he, he was being incredibly, well, scary, frankly. 
they're basically saying that you know, central banks around the world have been blowing asset bubbles by keeping interest rates far too low. You know, this caused the, the imbalances that led to the uh, Lehman crisis and all blew up. Now they've done it again, except it's even worse this time, they argue, because they've drawn in all the emerging markets as well into the Ponzi scheme. So the entire world is leveraged to the hilt. So they, they're arguing that not only have debt levels actually risen in the developed rich countries since 2008 to about 275% of GDP, they've also risen quite a lot in the emerging market countries to about 175% of GDP, I think about 30% of GDP for each, for each block. So the whole global system is even more extremely leveraged than it was in 2008 when they said it was already dangerous. And they say we're now seeing all the signs of all the froth, you know, all the junk bond deals coming down to historic lows, all kinds of contract debt contracts, what are called covenant lights, very low protection sort of being issued, which basically shows that investors are just uh, reaching for yield on anything, accepting risk without asking questions. And, you know, we've seen these volatility indexes fall again also to historic lows. So they're, they're arguing that this is uh, we're primed basically for another massive crisis. Now, the IMF has been arguing the opposite case until recently. So you had a massive sort of showdown between these two premier sort of regulatory bodies of the global system, both essentially on the other side of the argument, fighting a quite tooth and nail sort of battle here. The IMF is getting a little worried, I think, and so it's starting to hedge its bets. It's come out recently and sort of warning about some of the same warnings more cautiously. Now, the, the BIS is calling for rate rises immediately. Just hit, just burst the bubble, pop it. Take it on, head head on, and if it causes a uh, you know market crash, too bad. That's their view. The IMF is not saying that. They're saying, well, okay, we need to watch it. We need to be careful. We need to use what's called macro prudential tools, which is where you kind of lean against the wind. You regulate, you know, the amount of mortgage credit. You regulate this. You regulate that. But you don't raise rates. You don't tighten monetary policy. So they're still uh, they they're, they're not reconciled yet. The IMF is still saying we'll keep the stimulus going, but they're hedging their bets. They were caught. Basically, the IMF did not see the whole Lehman crisis coming. And if you're the premier regulatory body in the world, that's, that's quite a big one to miss. So they're slightly uh, worried that they may be caught a second time. The whole thing blows up and they didn't see it coming a second time. So they're covering their bets right now. Isn't it interesting, though, that you have the two extremes of Larry Summers saying the only way forward is to move to a negative 3% interest rate? And on the other hand, BIS would say raise rates immediately to avert danger. And you know, you're not talking about unintelligent people on either side of the argument. Uh, it would seem, though, if you followed Larry Summers' prescription, you end up with the IMF's worst concern, BIS's worst concern, a bubble of epic proportion, as if what we had today in you know, the sovereign debt markets wasn't extreme already. Yeah, I mean, in fairness to Larry Summers, I don't think he's actually saying that, that should be done. He's saying we're in this really weird circumstances where theoretically that's what you need. So what do you do about it? And then, well, in in immediate terms, you, you, you deal with it through quantitative easing. So quantitative easing is a way of getting negative interest rates in effect. It's not quite the same, but it's sort of some of the same effect. And in, in, in the case of Europe, of course, uh, we're at the point where they've now got inflation, basically deflation nipping them at the heels. I mean, it's down to 0.4%. They're only one shock away from a, a major tipping over the edge into a Japanese-style trap. And they may be getting that shock right now as it, as it happens. You know, they're kind of more in the BIS camp. They don't want to be drawn into all of this. So they're kind of holding back, holding back. And besides, there's an internal problem because Germany doesn't want it. And Germany is basically the dominant voice and has a veto on policy. Uh, and Germany's in a totally different place from these other economies. And it can handle higher rates. Uh, the others can't. So there's a whole internal dispute, you know, and who's running, who runs the ECB? Is it a political animal? Is it a, is it a real central bank? I mean, all these questions. So they're sort of paralyzed. Not They, they probably need to do QE immediately on a very large scale. Um, and I don't suppose the hard money listeners would like to hear that, but I mean, that's the general view among economists. They need to bite the bullet immediately. But the difficulty is, I mean, there's a point about QE. The QE works for the countries that do it in the sense that they get out of the mess. And it's worked in the US, it's worked in Britain, and to some degree it's working in Japan. That's kind of the jury's out on that. You get out of your mess. And you do, in fact, by not letting deflation take root, by keeping inflation going, you erode the real value of the debt. So your, your debt ratios do start to come down. The problem is, this is what the BIS has been arguing about, it may work for one country in isolation, but this just switches all the problems to somebody else. 
all this stimulus leaks out to other countries that can't cope with it. It creates these sort of massive bubbles all over the world. And then everybody's drawn into the mess. It's what's called a Pareto suboptimal, to use an academic term. When, you know, it, it works in the end, it comes back and it's worse for everybody. And it's even worse for the countries that started off and think they've gained a bit of advantage to start with. And in some respects, it's a little like bigger than neighbor devaluations in the 1930s. This is the argument that BIS is making. Now, I don't really agree with this, but I think it's fascinating. And they are very intelligent people. And Claudio Borio, their, their chief economist, and so I mean, he's one of the most brilliant economic minds in the world. I mean, I take them very, very seriously, but in the end, I don't. They're rather great minds, and they, they, you know, you have to choose. Uh, you have to choose, and these are these are very high stakes at the moment. So, if Europe is essentially in a debt trap, you know, adding new debt is not likely the answer to the problem. You have financial repression, you have inflation, you have debt rescheduling, and all of those have been tactics of the treasuries uh, and central banks of the past. Should we expect to see more of this? As you said earlier, inflation is the taboo. German central bank won't have anything of it. And Draghi doesn't mind if the euro dips lower for other reasons, but he's not willing to print. Are the other options sufficient? Well, Draghi desperately wants to do QE, desperate to do it. Uh, he desperately wants the euro to weaken a lot. But he doesn't, you know, he's only the president of the European Central Bank. He doesn't control it. Only and ultimately, president. Germany controls it. So he can't. So what he's trying to do is talk down the euro while his hands are tied behind his back. He can't actually do anything. Uh, now, to some, eventually, this will happen. A euro will, will will fall. But the difficulty there's a point that sometimes needs explaining here. The debt ratios of Southern Europe are, are rocketing, and they're rocketing even though they're doing austerity. Like Italy, it's, Italy's debt ratio has gone up from basically 130 to 135 percent of GDP in one year, even though it's running a large primary budget surplus. Even though it's been pushing through one austerity package after another, it's in a vicious circle. In other words, it's part of the reason the debt ratio is going up is because of the austerity policies. It's a lethal mix of near zero inflation with recession. Is the reason they won't talk about rescheduling or restructuring because they've lost some autonomy in the mix of, 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 of joining the European Monetary Union? Well, you do lose all your control, sovereign control. You no longer have a central bank, you no longer have a currency, you no longer really control your macroeconomic policy. So, But the difficulty is, I mean, if you've got your own sovereign currency, you're not going to default because you'll never default because you just print it. Exactly. Like we so, so the issue disappears. It's only, it's only when you join a currency union does this issue of, of default debt restructuring come onto the table. And this is what Italy is now caught in. And it's ratio shooting up. And let me just point out here that for every 1% fall in the inflation rate below the ECB's 2% target means the budget surplus they have to run just to stabilize the debt is at 1.4% higher. This is pure mathematics of it. And so you know, now they're at zero inflation, basically. So that they have to run almost an 8% primary surplus just to stabilize the debt. It becomes impossible. So the more the thing deflates, the more they get into this vicious cycle, the worse it gets. And these ratios are rocketing up. Same in Portugal. They're heading straight towards basically debt restructuring and a massive sovereign debt crisis. Yeah, this is the argument of the liquidationist. Either you cancel or restructure. Markets have a very short memory of these things. I know that in Europe it's, it's very taboo to, you know, for a corporation to go bankrupt. But U.S. bankruptcy code allows for a person or company simply to start over and, you know, shed the, the encumbrance. Europe used to do that not in formal default, but through currency devaluation. They can't do that now, but it seems like this issue, we are so close to a decision that could solve the problem, it's just not politically palatable. You can deal with this two ways. I mean, either you can simply have a higher rate of inflation and uh, just chin up the money supply, do QE, get it going, do what the Japanese are doing, uh, and you get Italy off the reefs. Italy would not have to default. If the whole policy structure in Europe was different, Italy would not have to default. It's only because of the policies they're pursuing, their contractionary policies, that is grinding them deeper into this mess. Now, you know, you can take the alternative view and say, right, okay, well, we pursue a hard money policy, we force a default. Okay. Now, forcing a default in a country that has the world's third biggest public debt, two trillion euros, which is what, $2.7 trillion at this point? Plus, it wouldn't be contained because at that point, you'd, you'd, you know, Portugal would go down too. And I don't see how you could separate Spain even at that, at that point. So you'd be getting into a four, four and a half, five trillion dollar debt default, sovereign debt default. At that point, you'd have an absolutely explosive global crisis. And, uh, you know, these, these are much bigger figures than Lehman or anything that was happening then.
much bigger. And we'll leave aside China, which we'll probably get onto. But, you know, the world would, that would be a massive shock to the world, to the global system. Besides, it would bring down the banking systems of Europe. I don't know who could step in as a lender of last resort at this point, because I think at that point, the European Central Bank's own credibility would be shattered. And I don't think it would be able to play the role that, say, the Fed could play, because at the end of the day, it doesn't have any kind of government behind it. It's a kind of orphan central bank. It's a bit of a bluff. You know, if you go that route, sure, you can go that route, but be prepared for the consequences. Well, and it seems that that's what we don't want to see occur, is anyone sort of live with the consequences. I, you have an investor class who owns a lot of bank debt, a lot of sovereign debt, and it's as if they've had a free pass. It's a one-way ride. You can go up, but it won't go down. We have your back completely. I wonder if we're talking about concentrated wealth and the political inability to allow the chips to fall where they may. I mean, you, you look at the default recently of the bank in Portugal. I'd like to know who owns that bank debt because someone was protected. And I don't understand why moral hazard is perpetuated for the benefit of a few when we're really talking about an impact that ultimately is for the Portuguese household. Now, this is not some sort of a populist rant. I'm just wondering why there isn't in the marketplace the good and the bad. Everyone knows that when you put your money down, you can make money and you can lose money, except in this case, you can't lose because central banks are afraid of this domino effect throughout the banking system. Now, I understand they're trying to protect the banking system, but what about the investors in the banking system? Is there not some differentiation between the investors in bank debt and the banking system as a whole? Well, in, I mean, in the case of Portugal, I mean, it is quite an odd case. You know, we have these new sort of uh, rules coming in place in Europe, which is essentially all the shareholders and all the creditors, bondholders get wiped out before the taxpayer takes a hit. And these are sort of coming into force over the next couple of years. But basically, the principles are already laid out. And in this case, this was the first test case. And they panicked and they didn't, they backed away from it. They're imposing haircuts on the um, junior bondholders, but not on the senior senior bondholders. Mm -hmm. Now, they're arguing, well, you don't, we don't need to do it, and the taxpayer is totally protected. Now, I don't think any of the analysts I've talked to believe that. They think this is going to land on the shoulders of the long-suffering Portuguese taxpayer before this is all over. And so I agree that somebody was protected here, the owners of these bonds. Now, why did the European Commission sign off on this? It goes against their own principles because I think, they're t- I think they're frightened. I think they were worried that, that this could set off uh, a chain reaction. They've got other things on their hand. They've got this Russia crisis sort of is welling up on them. Half of your Eurozone seems to be either in or very close to recession again. The whole recovery they were banking on is just sort of sputtered out. And they're, they're worried. And they're worried that this could just set off a fresh round of this thing. But, you know, Despite their rhetoric that this crisis is completely over and they've, they've solved the problem, they know that's not true. They know that it's still festering and it could come back and bite them at any time. And so I think that that's what cause them to do this. But you're you're right. I mean, their intention is exactly what you say, to make sure that, that, you know, anybody who buys bank debt, they get wiped out if they make a mistake, if that bank behaves recklessly. The intention, but there's many a slip between the cup and the lip. But I mean, there's an interesting question internally in Portugal, and it's a big scandal about this in in Portugal, you know, who exactly, who owns all this debt and were they protected? Has Has the Portuguese central bank intervened in such a way to protect vested interest in Portugal, that there is a big separate scandal going on on that issue. We haven't heard the last of that one. So if you have Europe's stalled recovery, you've got Italy you know, tripping into a recession and triple dip, so to say. Is Russia and Ukraine the easy political scapegoat for policies that have failed to revive growth in the Eurozone? It's Vladimir Putin who's setting the pace on this. I mean, he rewrote the borders of Europe by force. It f- hasn't been done since 1945, by the way. It's the second time he's done it. He did it in Georgia, but Georgia people were sort of still kind of a bit stunned by it. It was only on a small scale. Now he's just ripped up part of Ukraine and pocketed it after, you know, in a way in which, you know, he massively misled all the European and Western leaders in the process. So there's an incredible feeling of anger about it. So he's setting the pace. This isn't some diversionary tactic, you know, by Europe because of its economic crisis. It is a reversionary tactic by Putin because of Russia's economic crisis. Uh, 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 it's the other way.
way around. You know, Russia's gone into deep structural decline. The latest IMF report on, on, on Russia is completely devastating. I mean, its, its whole growth model is obsolete. It's picked all the low-hanging fruit it could, it could get. It's got massive structural problems. It's now become you know, a victim of the Dutch curse, over-reliant on commodity exports. The rest of its industry has been hollowed out. It's an economic basket case. And the problem is, you know, it, it, it was almost in recession or even before this whole thing erupted in Ukraine. And so quite clearly, Putin is motivated by a kind of, I mean, a, a sort of nationalist agenda, of basically rebuilding essentially an informal, either informal or actually formal Russian empire, extending it back into areas of Eastern Europe that thought they had escaped it. Now, you can argue from a distance, and I know people get very emotional about this on both sides, you know, that, that he was provoked or this. I mean, I, I just don't buy that. I mean, I, frankly, you know, Europe, Western Europe, the European Union is a pacifist status quo, declining organization, economy, society. Couldn't say boot to a goose. He wasn't even letting Ukraine in. It was trying to keep Ukraine out because it didn't want the costs of Ukraine. It didn't want the, all the massive immigration from Ukraine. It was trying to sort of keep them at a, you know, keep them friendly, but at a somewhat safe distance. So the idea that they were about to take over and, ex, you know, essentially absorb Ukraine into this Western NATO structure that posed a, a huge threat to Russia, I think is absurd. And I, I, I know it's, it's been widely claimed, but I, it's just not the sequence of events that led to this. And it was engineered at every stage by Russia. And uh, we are now where we are with, you know, with 17 battalions of Russian troops massed on the border of Ukraine, you know, with artillery, tanks, heavy aircraft, uh, you know, um, poised. Well, we'll see. We'll find out. We might find out by over the weekend what the next stage is. He only has a few more days to decide. You know, this is to us just one more sort of finger of instability. It's not a defining factor in the world economy, but it is one factor. And you never know what serves as a trigger in an environment of general instability. It's pretty big. The Ukrainian government is basically launching right now the Battle of the Donbass to retake, you know, Donetsk and Luhansk. And, and this is the final showdown. And uh, it's sort of happening as we speak and be going on for the next few days. And Putin has to decide, does he cut his losses, accept defeat, retreat back, essentially take his proxy forces out, abandon the whole endeavor, in which case he would not survive in Russia politically. He would be roasted by his own much harder line nationalists than him. He's been trying to cover his flank against a chauvinist uh, factions that have been becoming very vocal in Russia. So he, he, I don't think he could survive. He'd have to abandon anyway what his whole kind of geostrategic strategy and his whole mission, which is sort of essentially to reconstitute, you know, Russia as a great power and as a great European power, not some Asian power. This is a fundamental clash. It's a fundamental clash of interests. You know, he's going to have to choose. You know, does he step back? Just let it all happen. Now he's brought about, Ukraine had basically been a kind of a neutral state until then because the Europeans and NATO was not allowing it to join. And now, of course, it's an entirely, it's become very, very hostile to Putin. So he, he brought about what he most feared, which is a hostile Ukraine. Now, is he going to live with that? Well, we'll find out. Or is he going to double down and just um, invade? And the outcome of that for the world economy and for the world geostrategic system is just um, enormous because that then causes all, a whole chain of, of other things to happen. You know, all the, all the, the bricks. And what position are they going to take on this? What position is China going to take on this? What position is Brazil going to take on this? Let's talk about that because there's there's these two themes that in terms of the BRICS and the emerging markets, number one, we have the implicit loyalty of India, China, Brazil, uh, South Africa, it's sort of the up and coming crowd. And they figure, you know, it's it, collectively we can be sort of chummy and, and stand toe to toe with the other great powers of the world. Collectively, we have a huge contribution to global GDP, et cetera, even if in, singularly it's less so. You've got Fed tightening, which is just around the corner. Why they chose October, I have no idea. If they looked at the Stock Traders Almanac, I think they'd find that to be an absolutely absurd time to be pulling liquidity from the markets. Nevertheless, what are the impacts of this issue, Russia, concern about Russia, countries having to choose for themselves? What side are you going to stand on, a dollarized world or a non-dollarized world? And here's the Fed tightening with ramifications for liquidity flows into the equity markets, the emerging market, bond markets. Talk about the ricochet effect. Well, firstly, you know, this whole question of the BRICS, you know, I mean, 
To my knowledge, uh, there is no European country that has a claim on Russian territory. China has a very major claim on Russian territory, you know, that was taken from it in the 19th century in in the Far East, and it wants it back. China and Russia are fundamental rivals in in Central Asia. You've got this battle going on over, you know, control of the uh, of the gas reserves in you know, Turkmenistan and and uh, so forth. The pipelines are now being redirected towards China and away from Russia. Russia is losing its control, and you know they're rivals. They're rivals, and we've been through this, you know, the last 60, 70 years. We've all, you know, in the Soviet era, when there were the communist era, when they seemed to be allies, and there were all these pieties that made people in the West think they were close allies working together. In fact, they were sort of at each other's throats. And I don't, I don't think a lot of that is really, you know, there's is an appearance of working together. Well, China will quite clearly take advantage of any weakness in Russia for its own um, benefit. It'll drive a really hard bargain. It's done that on the gas deal with Gazprom. It was signed in May. I mean, Russia capitulated completely, it accepted terms that it had never accepted before because it was so desperate. It needed this sort of the image of, of China coming in here to save them as, as you know, in their confrontation with the West. It was very important to them. So they basically did sign the deal in which they're going to lose money producing gas, essentially. And, you know, we'll find out the sanctions essentially cut Russia off at the knees. The, the, it's frozen out of the, the global financial system. And these new sanctions are completely unlike any of the old sanctions of the 90s or 80s. There's this team at the U.S. Treasury that's been refining this for the last decade. They've got a cell there working on this. They've tried it out on about nine different countries. You know, they brought North Korea to its knees. They brought Iran to its knees. It works. It's totally different from the previous mechanisms. The thing about globalization, through control of the financial system, you have much more power. And in a way, America's financial power is as great now as it's ever been in history. That's the irony. America may be, in other respects, losing, well, not exactly losing influence, but sort of on decline, but not in that area. And Russia, this is going to be absolutely devastating for Russia. And the Europeans have now you know, completely uh, matched it and, in fact, exceeded it in some respects. So have the Japanese. Uh, the question is whether the Chinese come in here and provide finance and on what terms. And people will be looking very closely at this. Now, my guess is they're not going to do very much. And if they do, it'll be on an excruciating sort of cost for Russia. But again, they are going to have to decide. In the case of you know, Brazil and South Africa, both, by the way, in, you know, either in recession or near recession, both in structural crises, as is Russia, you know, do they really want to line up with, with Putin if he launches a full-blown invasion of Ukraine? I mean, do they really want to do that? What's in it for them? I mean, what is, is sort of arrangement, really, the BRICS. They've got a whole lot of interlocking relationships with countries around the world. Why would they want to sort of immolate themselves for the sake of of Vladimir Putin? I mean, it it, it just seems to me the whole thing's rather far-fetched. Anyway, on the point about Fed tightening, I mean, you know, the great issue about it here in the world is the moment in which America reaches what's called Nairu, when the unemployment rate falls low enough to start causing major wage pressures. And we're getting very, very close to that. And we were already seeing several, many of the Fed hawks, you know, sort of pushing for rate hikes. I think Janet Yellen's going to have to come along very soon. Probably, you know, by the well, certainly by October they'll be ending. They will have finished tapering bond purchases, and that, by the way, has an effect. That has a real money effect. They're reducing it by 10 billion at each meeting. Essentially, you will be withdrawing 85 billion dollars of stimulus from the financial system by the time we get to October compared to what it was before. And, you know, it may, we may find out that actually the American system needs that just to sort of keep going. We don't know yet. But in any case, there'll be signaling tightening coming much earlier, signaling rate rises coming much earlier. And some are now talking about as early as April or probably April early next year, which is a lot sooner than they'd said. The Fed thought it would take about another 14 months for unemployment to get as low as it is now. So the whole thing's been pulled forward enormously. And, I mean, you could say that they're victim of their own success. So, you know, great, unemployment's come down. I mean, there are all kinds of problems with the U.S. job data, as you know, and there's huge kinds of disguised unemployment, and that's all well known. The difficulty for the rest of the world is U.S. can probably handle some monetary tightening, but can anybody else? And this is this is likely to be similar to the, I think, to the early 1980s and then to the mid-1990s, two earlier phases of Fed tightening when you had the dollar started going up, a long secular dollar rally, and it just caught all these other countries that were, that were overextended and had borrowed too much in dollars, suddenly caught them on the wrong side. And it had devastating effects. as in the Latin American crisis, of course, in the early 80s and the early 90s. It was, in the mid-90s, it was, you know, uh, well, we, the East Asia crisis. 
and then led to the Russian default, and it ricocheted across the entire world by the time it had finished. And I think that's the risk we could be going into this. DIS is, is essentially $10 trillion of cross-border lending in hard currencies, mostly dollars, to emerging markets. And that's risen from $4 trillion a decade ago. So a dollar rally is basically devastating to the emerging markets because of this $10 trillion debt burden that they hold in dollar terms. Yeah, and there's lots of, there's some particularly concentrated sort of elements of this. For example, there's 1.2 trillion essentially a carry trade in dollars from Hong Kong into China. Now, the Chinese companies and banks were circumventing the internal credit controls in China by going outside the system and getting it from Hong Kong, and they got it in dollars. And they thought at that point, they thought the dollar was going to weaken and the Chinese one was going to get stronger and stronger. So they thought it was a one-way bet. Huge amount of flows going this way. And of course, that could reverse and become very, very nasty. Now, the one has actually fallen this year against the dollar. But if you have a really major dollar rally, that you could have a huge squeeze. And I know they're very worried about this. The BIS, the IMF, the Bank of England, I know they're all extremely worried about this. This could be one of the big triggers. And of course, the whole scale of the, the credit bubble in China is, is, is so huge that it has global implications at this point. So I want to go back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of the U.S. Treasury and the pressure that we're bringing right now on Russia. Because the emerging markets, I don't think we've finished with. But I, I wanted to ask a question if, in fact, the Treasury is operating like the Department of Defense, why wouldn't Russia feel like they've been put on a war footing by what is being orchestrated from Trump? Well, I think it is war. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I think it is war. That's why I think people are remarkably complacent about it. I don't think Russia can retaliate by um, financial and economic means. I mean, it's, you know, it's a minnow. It's, it's, Russia's economy is the same size as California's. I mean, it's irrelevant. Its only relevance is its uh, oil and gas supply, which, you know, can be switched off. But uh, it's not an instrument that Russia can use because it would destroy itself very quickly. But Russia's economy is tiny. So they're up against the entire OECD bloc, who are essentially in complete unity on imposing sanctions. You know, I mean, Japan, Australia, Canada. So it's two trillion against 40 trillion. There's no match. It's asymmetric. Now, what he can do is he can counterattack in some totally different way. He could launch uh, cyber attacks. The Russians are very good at that. It is believed they already shut down a, a, an Illinois water system in an experiment. And uh, now, then you, you'd be testing what are the American defenses. And there's been quite a bit of, of suggestions from, well, I, I believe, in fact, the head of the CIA, uh, uh, among others, testified to Congress that they really not don't have adequate defenses at all and they're totally vulnerable to a, a major cyber attack. And if there's any country in the world that's capable of delivering that, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's Russia. Although I don't suppose the Chinese are slouches either are doing that. So, yeah, I mean, he will retaliate by some means where he can inflict a lot of damage. It's not going to be economic because he can't inflict any damage economically. It'll be something else. And will he do it? I think it's a very high likelihood he will, yeah. So you may be making a slightly different point here, you know, well, therefore should the U.S. Treasury have done this? That's a political judgment. I mean, he started it. I mean, I just don't accept the line that, um, that this is a U.S. coup in Ukraine. I just think it's asinine. And the sequence of events, the U.S. is really trying to catch up with events in Ukraine. It was behind the curve. It wasn't in control. And it's been sort of struggling to catch up ever since. So I, it's clear to me who began this thing. I mean, we're going to argue about this forever in the West. Uh, I came at this with a relatively neutral view, but just events just escalated so fast. And, and then when Yanukovych in Ukraine opened fire on and massacred a hundred of his own people in cold blood, I mean, and then the police refused to, after that, to enforce the anti-riot actions and just melted away and the regime collapsed. Everything stems from that. And it's clear to me, and I, I was in, in Ukraine actually last year, and I, it, it's clear to me that this is a spontaneous revolution. I don't think the U.S. orchestrated it or caused it or really had much influence over it at any point. It tried to gain influence, but didn't have much. So I, I don't accept the view of being made, arguments being made by many, including many in, in America, I note, that somehow the U.S. provoked this. I have to admit, I'm, I was a cold warrior in the 1980s, I mean, back in um, you know, in Central America, and uh, I, I was very much opposed to what the Soviet Union was doing and what they were doing in Poland at the time. And I, you know, I have um, a memory goes back to what they did when they controlled these countries and how they acted. And it seems to me people rather, rather too easily forget, you know, it's only 20 years, or is it 23 years now, since, you know, uh, Russian forces and Russian security apparatus controlled half of Europe. 
Sure. I would tend to agree with you that the point of cause perhaps is one thing. The State Department's position and willingness to pressure, not only 23 years ago, but every year since then, the U.S. State Department and CIA has, has pressed for advantages. And I can't complain about the results. Uh, living in America, the results have been splendid. It just doesn't do anything in terms of ingratiating us or creating a sense of, of global well-being. Uh, it's not how you sort of foster fraternity. U.S. foreign policy has, has been anything but polite. I think there were much more serious cases of that. I mean, you know, the invasion of Iraq in 2003, you know, that, I mean, that was one which caused a massive hemorrhage of goodwill the United States worldwide and did huge damage. I think this is of a totally different kind. I think to most countries, the U.S. is not the initiator in this. And it's actually working very closely with the Europeans. It's a sort of, you know, the, the, Putin's attempt to split the alliance, to split the Atlantic alliance on this hasn't worked at all. At the end of the day, you know, the Europeans and the Americans are basically working very, very closely together. And they've come up with very similar policies. His attempt to split the EU internally has not succeeded either. Essentially, all the countries, even those who are much more willing to accommodate him, are towing the line, the EU line now basically being determined by Germany, Britain, and France. In this case, I mean, Obama's, he's pursued this quite sort of gentle step-by-step -step policy of escalation. I think it's very hard to say, you know, that they went out like cowboys. I think what you're saying applies much more to the Iraq war. That was a moment of massive damage to the to U.S. credibility and its, its image as a benign force in the world. I mean, massive damage. And quite apart from the consequences of, of that action, I don't know what, I mean, many of your listeners may have fought in this war, and I don't want to, I want to be very careful what I say here. Just in terms of analyzing global uh, diplomacy, that had a very, very dramatic effect. And I, I know I, I was quite, I was in, remember, Tokyo last year, and I was talking to government officials and diplomats there, and I'm, the subject came up, and I was just surprised how even in Japan, which is a very close ally of, of America, even there, people were just were saying it was an absolutely terrible thing to have done. It was just so foolish and so badly executed and conducted, and the diplomacy so badly handled. And that was the view in Japan. I think that part of the reason we're seeing such suspicion of American motives now in, in Ukraine and is because of the legacy of that. People around the world are saying, well, you know, these bastards lied in, you know, uh, in 2003. They lied about Iraq. I mean, you can't believe anything they say. They invaded another country. Blah, 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 blah. You know, I mean, that is a perfectly understandable suspicion. But, you know, we're dealing with a totally different kind of administration. You're dealing with a totally different country, in my view. I mean, America sort of got overextended. It was a horrible war in many ways, terrible suffering for many of the troops who fought in it. And, uh, you know, America's licking its wounds and it's, it's pulling back. I mean, that's how I read it. And it doesn't really want to get entangled in all these things. It wants to stay clear. It's being very reluctantly dragged back into, you know, a conflict in Europe, which would far rather have never happened. And you could say, well, were mistakes made in the late 90s and the way Russia was treated? Were mistakes made at that point in sort of pushing for missiles to be reinstalled in, in Central Europe, in Poland? And uh, you know, were these mistakes... Was it a mistake to push NATO borders so far into parts of the old Soviet Union, the Baltic states, and so forth? You can have all this discussion. Were those mistakes made then, then at that point? Perhaps. Although I don't see how you could deny Latvia or Estonia the right to join a defensive alliance. I don't see how you could impose that veto upon sovereign countries that are members of the European Union. How could you do that? Sure. Well, let's look to the end of the year and, you know, what we see as uh, some considerable challenges, both from a monetary policy standpoint, from a fiscal policy standpoint. The U.S. has made some progress. Europe still has some progress to make. China has its challenges ahead. It gets complicated when you bring in geopolitics and not to muddy the waters with those issues, but just to say there's heightened concern now because you don't know exactly how political operators will choose. It's not just a matter of a monetary calculus or a fiscal calculus. There is also alliances to tend to, and geopolitics makes that very, very sensitive. If you were to take a guess, not, not along political lines, but just looking at the global economy as we march into the third quarter and into the fourth quarter of 2014, what do we have in front of us? We have a roaring dollar rally. And this is going to be a long secular rally that's going to run and run and run. And initially, maybe people can cope with it. I don't know. But as it becomes clear 
the, the tanker is turning, the Federal Reserve, the whole American economy is turning to, into a sort of tightening mode. And this stimulus is going to be drained back out of the global system. Uh, it's just going to send just tremors through everything. We had a, a taste of this last year with the taper tantrum. The first hawkish talk from Ben Bernanke, and it said, has set off this massive you know, flight from emerging markets, uh, surging bond yields and so forth. We had a second you know, episode of this uh, in, in January, but we haven't had the real one. That was just talk. And when we get the real thing kicking in and the real tightening, and it's just going on for month after month after month, that is when I think you're going to, you know, they'll start squealing. And we're going to see, uh, I think, another big sell-off in emerging markets. And we're going to see the ones that really haven't made the grade. They haven't developed viable, balanced economies. They've put off restructuring. They've essentially been exploiting a kind of primitive form of catch-up growth, which made them look good for a while. But fundamentally, they're, they're stuck in a middle-income trap, and they've hit the buffers, they've hit the ceiling. It's, it's going to expose all those countries, and I, I think most of the BRICs fall into that category, actually. And I suspect that the secondary effects of this will recoil straight back into Europe, where European banks have much more exposure to emerging markets than American banks, and will be what finally causes the next stage, the bigger stage of the Eurozone crisis. I'm not, I'm not sure quite on the cycle you're saying, the third quarter, fourth quarter, first quarter next year. Oh, it could be the end of 2015. Oh, end of 2015, yeah. Well, by then, yeah. By then, we may well be getting into all of this. Well, I mean, what we have in the makings is a significant downturn in terms of global GDP. Uh, sort of the scratch in the record gets revisited in terms of weakness in the European banks. E the emerging markets... We have U.S. investors and global investors who, on the basis of valuation metrics, have piled into emerging market equities on the basis of them being cheaper. Well, cheaper can get cheaper still. And so I mean, there is a potential hemorrhaging coming into 2015 in terms of the financial markets, both debt and equity, with the financial system being subject to tremendous pressure. Now, your argument is that this redounds to the benefit of the U.S. dollar as a safe haven play. Well, I think yeah, the rising dollar will it amounts to kind of short squeeze on all those who borrowed in dollars essentially around the world, and most of international lending is still done in dollars. People forget that we still live in a dollarized world. So when you get a major dollar rally, it just has all these chain reactions through the international credit system. And on the emerging markets, I mean, the IMF did an internal study. They concluded that roughly four hundred and seventy billion dollars had gone into emerging markets as a result of QE, a result of QE two actually, just QE two alone that would not have gone there otherwise. And they, they're afraid that it's, that's essentially hot money that'll just come out again as soon as you get the yield differentials, you know, as soon as you get rising rates in America and people pouring back in to take advantage of the you know, re American recovery. Well, doesn't this also argue for a period of time which is more reminiscent of the 80s and 90s when capital controls were far more common the world over? and where there were limits in terms of global trade and cross-border trade because of restrictions in terms of currency controls. When you start worrying about hot money and start worrying about a meltdown in your own economy, you start getting very defensive, and you also start thinking in very nationalist terms. Well, exactly. And capital controls are coming back into the frame. I mean, they're being talked about. Even the IMF is not talking about them as maybe necessary. So this is a whole new language. We're sort of moving away on many fronts from the sort of post-Cold War globalization sort of era. It'll probably be seen as a quarter century of sort of aberration, actually, in history when, when we look back at it, when everything was completely open, because it does create all these problems, these massive flows that capital countries can't control. And so I think they will impose capital controls. I think you already saw it late last year in the taper tantrum, taper tantrum one and two, you already saw it in certain countries, either partial or total, basically total capital controls in some countries was creeping in. I think about five different countries did it in different forms then. We're going to get a lot more of that. I might add that, you know, we don't know the Fed may back off again. Now, what happened with the first taper tantrum is the Fed was so shocked by what they brought about, which is this massive sell-off in emerging markets and the, and the surging bond yields, that they backed off. They did not do the tapering in, in, in September as expected. Do you remember that? Absolutely. And so they may back off again. Now, this time, they have Stanley Fisher as number two at the Fed brought in from the Bank of Israel, who's an expert on emerging markets, precisely in order to sort of try and avoid this and manage this whole issue uh, more carefully than last time. But at the end of the day, the Fed has a kind of closed, what's called a closed macroeconomy model. 
it looks at the U.S. economy internally. It doesn't really sort of fully take into account what its actions are globally. And this has, con- this has led to endless problems over the last few decades. I mean, it still does this. And my guess is that it, it will conclude from its own model that the U.S. can handle tightening. Until such a time when the devastation caused globally is so great and the blowback into the United States so acute that it's then forced to retreat. And then we go back and what do we do? We stop tightening the, you know, again? Do we even do QE4? I don't know. Yeah, I think that may well happen in the end, in, in fact, that they don't do this. They don't, in fact, tighten because they can't. Well, that is a clear possibility. These are absolutely challenging times to not only wrap our minds around but be making decisions in the context of and we appreciate your writing in the Daily Telegraph and uh, reporting from a British European perspective many of the issues which are so cogent and important for us to keep a beat on. So, do appreciate your time and your efforts ongoing and look forward to continuing the conversation later this year and into next year, touching base to see what you see. Thank you very much. Very nice to be with you. You've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oric along with David McIlvaney and our guest today, Ambrose Evans Pritchard. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com, or give us a call at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.